Gospel chapter 16, uh, looking at uh, portions and parts of the Great Commission. And we're now going to shift gears to Matthew 28. And I believe that the Lord is going to minister to your hearts uh, as he has mine uh, from the word of God. Let's get to it. Matthew's Gospel chapter 28. And we're going to begin in verse number 16. Here begins the reading of God's holy and eternal word. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee. To the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him. Mm -hmm, when they saw him. They worshipped him, but some doubted. Lord have mercy. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All power has been given to me in heaven and on earth. We dealt with that a little bit last week uh, from a different lens, dealing with the ascension and the enthronement of Christ. Tremendous. Go, therefore, and make, go and make, go and make, go and make disciples of all the nations, mm -hmm. baptizing them, watch me closely, in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them. To obey. My father-in-law says that obey is the full letter word of the church. So we don't like it. Teaching them to obey all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Even to the end of the age. Go therefore make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, teaching them to obey all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I want to key in, however, I'm going to touch all of it, but I'm going to key in on verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away with Jesus. They saw him, Brother Ron. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. I want to use for a subject this morning, very simply, you can't make me doubt it. Wow. You can't make me doubt it. One of my grandfather's favorite songs growing up, uh, as I would hear him sing it when he, before he would preach or after he would preach, or sometimes in the middle of him preaching, or sometimes at the end of him preaching, was, you can't make me doubt it. I know too much about him. You can't make me doubt him in my heart. I want to talk about this morning. You can't make me doubt it. You can't make me doubt it. Mm. Open the eyes of our understanding, Lord. Speak to us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Here we are at this particular passage of Scripture. One that speaks prophetically to where we are at this time. I am always amazed at how the Word of God has a way of speaking to us in moments of uncertainty. Moments of unfamiliarity. And moments that unilaterally transform us from where we are to where he's calling us to be. I'm blown away when I look at this particular passage of scripture because of the nuance of what Matthew begins to articulate as we get to the end of the journey. Uh, there's a song that I grew up listening to that said, when I've gone the last mile of the way. And I think about that this morning uh, because they are now at the last mile of the way. The last mile of the way being as Jesus has done what he said he was going to do. Hallelujah. And I'm excited about that this morning. Because even in a moment in which we live right now. In which many are beginning to hunger and thirst not just for righteousness but for a sense of normalcy. And in this moment, we must be reminded that Jesus did what he was sent to do. 
And the Bible says that the 11 disciples went away into Galilee. The word Galilee, Galilee is a place. He is the man from Galilee. Galilee is a place. But it is also, it means in the original Greek, it literally means a circuit. It means a circle. So they're going back to the beginning. Jesus is known as being one from Galilee, a Galilean. And they're going back to the origin spot. Uh, it's similar to when uh, my family grew up in the South, and so I know that there were some that would specifically come and see us on special occasions. Growing up, on a day like this, Mother's Day, uh, you would have a, a, a family spread, and they would come from different places, and everybody would come knowing that Grandma had made some good food. She would make some biscuits, and she made those biscuits by hand. She would make biscuits and she would have the biscuits sat and uh, sitting on the table and uh, there would be different varieties of entrees we didn't call them entrees we just call them meats okay but they would have different varieties of entrees and we would prepare ourselves to have a special meal uh, there was something special about home home is where the heart is but there's something unique uh, every time you hear the word home, it will always bring a different memory to you. And here we are. Jesus has completed his assignment. Jesus has done what he came to do. And they're coming back from the circle. And the circle is now coming full circle. And notice what the Bible says. The 11 disciples went away. Into Galilee, into a mountain. I want to stop there for a moment. First thing we see in this passage is the place. The place. The place. They go up into a mountain. I submit to you this morning, miracles happen at the mountain. Mm. Jesus. The new Moses, the fulfillment of all 613 laws in the old covenant. Just as God would have encounters face to face with Moses on the mountain. The disciples are now going up on the mountain to have a face to face encounter with the son of God. They're going to see him as he is. They've never seen him like this before. Because this Jesus is the post-resurrected Christ. So this is a new face that is not familiar to them. Because it is the face of victory. And I came to tell you this morning, even while we are still working through a vicious cycle and season of life, we still must be reminded that we are facing victory because we serve a victorious and resurrected Savior. So here they are on the mountain. And as they're on the mountain, it says they went where Jesus had appointed them. So we move from the place to the instructions and the insight of the person. The place is the mountain. The person is Christ. They went where Jesus had appointed them. I have a question for you this morning. Wherever you're listening, as we're sharing the word of God this morning, are you going where God has appointed you? Because there is only alignment when you are in obedience to your assignment. Hear me carefully. There is only alignment when you are in obedience to your assignment. So whenever you see something consistently not working, something is out of alignment. Whenever an area is out of alignment, it will never work. 
I don't know who that's for, what you're trying to make work. It could be a relationship, it could be a person, it could be, not, I don't know what it is, but I, I hear that very strongly. Alignment comes with the assignment. When you are in the will of God, even if the money doesn't add up, God will provide for you. Amen. When you are in the right place at the right time, even if the bank account doesn't say so, even if the benefits don't say so, when you are obedient to God and in alignment with the assignment, provision will come. And I prophesy to you, even now, in light of all the bad news we're hearing about unemployment rates going up and all kinds of things happening, God is going to align you in the right assignment. And there is always provision when you follow what God has done. I'm reminded of the prophet Elijah. When the brook had dried up, God had fed him for a while. Brother Ronald, God had fed him for a while. And while God had fed him for a while, 1 Kings 17, 18, 19, while he had been fed, the ravens were coming to feed him by the brook. And then the Bible says the brook began to dry up. And as the brook began to dry up, hallelujah, then God spoke again. Wait a minute. When lack hit, God spoke. Follow me. When he was full, he was feeding, he was able to receive. But when the brook dried up and lack hit again, God spoke. What baffles me is that just like the economic fallout of 2008, 9-11 challenges in 2001, the Great Depression in 1929, all of the challenges that we have had in this nation since Hiroshima and World War II. Every time lack came, there was always a word from God. Mm. When the brook dried up, I don't know who I'm preaching to this morning, but for some of you, you've been a place and you've been placed in a place in which it appears as if the brook dried up. When the brook dried up, God then said to Elijah, go to Zarephath. Woo! Yes. Go to Zarephath. I have prepared a widow to provide for you. The brook dried up. The ravens weren't coming. No, you're not supposed to sit up there and wonder why the ravens aren't here yet. Where's the raven at? It's time for me to eat. He said, no, go to Zarephath. So lack is a sign of that your assignment has changed. It's time to look at what you're experiencing differently. There are always possibilities that emerge out of problems. Anytime you see a problem, there is inside of that problem an untapped pregnant possibility. I don't know why God shifted me this way, but I'm going to be obedient by the Spirit of God. And I came to tell you this morning, in the midst of all these problems that we're seeing, God is going to creatively embed you with possibility to create solutions for what's to come. Bible says that Elijah is there by Zarephath. Zarephath in the original Hebrew means refinery. <laughs> Shout out to Pastor Jim. So God is saying now to Elijah, after the ravens have come, I'm going to feed you, but you've got to be refined. I've got to refine you. Uh, it is indicative, the picture is what Jeremiah says when he says that he went to the potter's house and God began to put him on the wheel. And I believe that this is a picture of where we are right now in this moment, where we are right now in this season. God has us all on the wheel to be refined. Uh, when I grew up, I was growing up, I went to a, a, a gifted uh, junior high school, and I had a, a great a great art teacher named Mr. Clocky, and he believed so much in me. He always would give me books, and maybe that's where I got that from, giving books out all the time. And, and he would give me books, and uh, around he, he gave me books, and we would be in class, and, and we would do artwork, and he had, he had pottery, in the classroom and, and what we did we had a kiln in the classroom and so all of us had to begin to put dents and indent marks inside of the pottery and then Mr. Clocky only him only he could touch it <laughs> only the master teacher can handle the heat hmm. 
he would take what we made and he would put it in the kiln and the fire would refine it. And when it came out, it looked magnificent. The clay was ruddy. Looked as if it was going to fall apart. But the fire refined it. And I came to tell you this morning, the fire of God is refining us. While we're in the kiln, while we're in a moment that does not make sense right now, when we look back, we'll be able to say, yes, indeed, you were there. Thinking about the old Reverend James Warner said he was there all the time, waiting patiently, in line, even when I didn't understand it, when I didn't see it. He was there waiting for us. Here is the dilemma, uh, as my brother would say, here is the prophetic dilemma of where we are in this passage this morning. Verse number 17. They saw him. They worshipped him. But some doubted. My, my, my. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubt. That wrestled with, I was wrestling with this all week long. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubt. When they saw him, when they saw him, that speaks to his presence. There's something about when we see him. Uh, when I was ministering on Wednesday uh, in our prayer time of prayer, the Spirit of the Lord reminded me uh, that there's something special that happens when we see him. When they saw him, that, that speaks of his presence. That is indicative of intimacy with God. One of the challenges today is that many, uh, reason why sometimes it gets so challenging when it comes to relationships and all of that that gets sticky, is because we seek intimacy first from a person instead of understanding the person of Christ. Yes. Intimacy with God establishes your identity. Intimacy with God establishes your identity. And out of that intimacy, out of that identity, then it brings and paves the way for intentionality. So we want to be intentional first. We want to be, we want to know our own identity by creating it and carving it out ourselves. And we want to be intimate with a person outside of first being intimate with God. And then we wonder why the relationships, connections, and things don't work out. Because our intimacy must first be seated in who Christ is. When I learn who he is, I discover who I am. When I understand who he is, I come to understand how he's wired and made me to be. Therefore, I'm not worried about when someone else is taller than me, got more head than me, got this than me, and all kinds of stuff. I understand that I'm called to compliment with them and not compete with them. Because my identity is rooted in my intimacy with Christ. I want you to hear what I'm saying this morning. And so notice, when they saw him, his presence, they worshipped him. Pasha. When they saw him, I gotta go there for a moment. When they saw him, his presence, they worshipped him, changed their posture. I want to stop for just a moment there. When they saw his presence, their posture changed. That word worship literally means proskuneo. It speaks, it speaks to, it is symbolic of a dog kissing the hand of its master. It is symbolic of bowing down. It is to pay obeisance. It literally is to bow down. They saw him presence and they worshipped him posture. But some doubted. Now, I wrestled with this, and the Spirit of the Lord said to me, in the sun, when they saw him, they saw his presence. When they worshipped him, they bowed in their posture. But when some began to doubt, pretense set in. Mm. Wow. I said, Lord, what do you mean? That pretense set in. They, they were wavering. That word, but doubted, uh, in its original context, it means to waver. It means to waver. 
Uh, it, it means to, if you want to contextualize it, to be sometime. Lord, have mercy. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been waiting on something to get done? And the person you were waiting on it from was sometime? Mm -hmm. Have you ever had to get construction work done? <laughs> and you had a plumber? We had a plumbing issue at our house this week. And we were counting down to when he was going to show up. Uh, why? Because when you are waiting for something, when you're in need for something, you need consistency in the moment. Amen. But the Bible says that some doubted. Some began to waver. Some began to question. Some began. But, but, but the power of the text is not in the sum. The power in this verse is that they all still bowed. Mm. Because when they saw him, when they saw his presence, they immediately began to posture themselves. I'm broken by what I've experienced, but I'll still bow down. <laughs> I'm wavering in my faith in this moment, but I'll still worship you. Somebody watching me this morning, you've been wounded by the last few weeks, but while you're wounded, you'll still worship him. And I came to tell somebody this morning, this is exactly where we are in this time period in which while we may waver in not fully understanding what is going to happen, what is happening, we cannot allow the ambiguity of the moment to cause us to lose sight of the authority of God. He says, they worship. I hope this is blessing somebody. They worship, but some doubt. And God, <laughs> being God, oh, him of the church, oh, how I love Jesus. I used to sing that growing up, and it was sometimes it would annoy me because it's like some services we would sing that song the whole time. Oh, how I would mock it. Oh, how I love. But as I'm older now, oh, how I really love Jesus. Amen. I, I love him. Why? Because he first loved me. God was big enough to handle their wavering. Mm. So, so the Great Commission is set in the context of worship. Thank you, Holy Ghost. But it is also set in the context of wavering. But despite the worship and despite the wavering, God is still big enough to release what he's promised them. And I came to tell somebody this morning, you might still feel a little wounded. I feel an evangelist spirit on me this morning. You might still feel a little wounded. You might still not know what's going to happen next. But no matter what it looks like, can you still bless him when you still feel broken? Can you still open up your mouth and worship him when you're not sure how all of this is going to piece together? Yes. What they were able to do uh, is say, despite the hurt I've encountered, uh, you don't understand. Let me make this plain for you. The one they worshipped and adored uh, was hung high and stretched wide. They whipped him and they beat him uh, and he died for them. But they were also mocked in society. And the passage before this, uh, the Bible says uh, that they were trying to pay off the guards uh, and they were trying to convince the guards to say that Jesus never really did get up from the grave. So those who had followed him were the laughing stock of society. If they were alive today, they would be the ones in memes that people would make fun of. But God gave them the last laugh in the midst of them wavering, in the midst of them doubting, in the midst of tears in their eyes, in the midst of hurting. He showed up. Yes. Jesus said, Glory to God. They saw him. They worshiped him. Mm. Some doubt. Presence. Posture. Pretense. And God is really saying to them, It's all right. <laughs> it's all right, brother. It's all right. I can handle that. Why? 
Because the key is in verse number 18. And Jesus came yeah. and spoke to them saying, All power. All power. In heaven and on earth has been given to me. You might feel as if you have not been empowered. But what I'm about to give you is going to set the world on fire. Mm. All power has been given to me. So now we see the power. The power, hold it now, the power, he says, has been given to me in heaven and on earth. I told you last week in Mark 16 that he literally says to them, when he ascends, we see the ascension. But when he sat down, we see the enthronement. So he says, all power has been given to me in heaven. And on earth. Now, what are you going to do with that? So Jesus is saying to them, watch this now. Watch me carefully. I have all authority. I'm almost ready to be. And because I have all authority, I can also authorize. I have all authority, and therefore I can authorize you. So the one with all authority authorizes us with his anointing. The one with all authority authorizes us with his anointing to do what? The Bible says he, authority, he authorizes them, which means what? That they have special clearance. I never forget as I close. I never forget my wife and I were going for her birthday with one of our friends years ago, uh, Jordan Sparks, and they had a, a, a concert of sorts at Madison Square Garden, and we were going. And I had never, Brother Ron had never been to Madison Square Garden uh, as a special guest of someone. My Lord. I went, my brother went over. He wasn't as a guest. We sat in the nose bleeding like everybody else. Yep. Hallelujah. Amen. And this was my first time going in. And boy, when I sat there and I said, okay, this performance is over. We're going, right? She said, no, 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 no. She said, we can come in. So we're going. And they had somebody escort us. He said, uh, are you so and so? Yes, follow me. And we followed them. And we're walking, and I'm seeing people I know and all that. I say, hey, hey, how you doing? Just keep walking. Follow me. Don't talk. Don't stop. Okay, we walk. And they walk us out of the back of the garden and into where all the green rooms are. And as we're going there, we're standing there. Knock, knock. Show credentials. And they let us in. And I realize that that is the same thing that Jesus does in this text. <laughs> he looks at his disciples and says, I'm going to give you access. Access that enables you to access my power in a way that you have never seen before. So when someone is sick, follow me. <laughs> yeah. You can lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. I want you to tell somebody and tell them, I have access. God has given me access. Don't knock your clearance. You don't have to worry about VIP sections on earth. You have received it in heaven. God has access. He's authorized you. This week, so I'll come back next week. Notice what happens. He says to them, go therefore and make disciples. Of all nations. I'm going to close with this. I'll finish the rest of it next week. Go therefore and make disciples. Go. As you go. As you go. As you go. I go with you. As you go. I go with you. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Notice the distinction here. And I'm closing with this. I'm closing with this. I'll finish the rest next week. We heard the first go in Mark 16. In which he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. This time he says, go and make. So disciples are not born, they're made. Mm. Go and make. In other words, what he's saying is fashion and shape. Mm. Go and make disciples of 
all nations. I'll pick the rest of this up next week. Of all nations. Now he says, go into all the world in Mark 16 and preach the gospel. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go into all the world. The word world, there is the word cosmos. As I said before, it speaks of order. It speaks of created order. It speaks of systems. Here he says, go and go and make disciples of all nations. The word nation there is the word ethnos, which now speaks to different ethnicities, different groups. So now I'm not just calling you into the systems of the world. I'm calling you to people who don't look like you, act like you, talk like you, or speak like you. Because if this just stays with you, this is a cult, not a church. My Lord. Mm. In a cult, everybody has the same language. Everybody has the same way they do. Everybody has the same thing. You're not a droid. You're a demonstration of the kingdom. Hallelujah. Wow. You better hear what I'm saying. So what I'm calling you to do is not a cult. It's a community of people that have been redeemed by my blood. So in order, oh, I want you to hear what I'm saying. So in order for you to demonstrate the kingdom of God, I am not keeping this just to you. I'm calling all nations, all ethnic groups. What he's really saying is the kingdom of God is a new species. The kingdom of God is a new kind. The kingdom of God is a new race. The kingdom of God is a new people because they have been redeemed by the blood. As I close this message, I'm not out of word, but I'm out of time. I close this message. My wife's first Mother's Day. I want to go home a little early. As I close this message, Amen. I want you to hear me. I'll never forget a few years ago, I was able to sit and break bread with a man that was very influent, very wealthy. He was telling us a story about his granddaughter and his business partner. That man was Caucasian, he was white. His business partner was a black guy. and They, they were both older gentlemen. And the granddaughter came, sat up on the lap, the grandfather said, Granddaddy, look, look. She was a baby, barely could talk. She said, Look, 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 look. He said, Yes. She said, Grandpa, look, look, look. She said, Uncle's skin is brown. She said, My skin is light. She said, But both of our blood is red. Mm. Jesus. <laughs> she said, He said, What? And when he said it, all of a sudden he said, He busted out crying. Jesus. He said because she could tap into something. You come to the kingdom as a child. She could tap into something. Amen. That nobody else around the table could even see. She said, she said, Papa, she said, she said, she said, my skin is light. She said, his skin is brown. She said, but our blood is red, Papa. She said, our blood is red. She said, we have the same blood. Jesus. I came to tell you this morning. The same blood of Jesus. Mm. Hallelujah. Is the blood that can wash you, yes. that can redeem you, that can heal you, that can set you free. And so I say to you today, no matter what, you can sell it the saints of old. You can't make me doubt. I know too much about him. What? What do I know about him? I know that he died for me. Yes. 